debate track, committee room, assembly room. <laughs> Are you ready for abomination, Kathleen? No, not at all. <laughs> That's next. I don't have to worry about that until tomorrow. Okay, are we ready? I'm ready. Okay. They, gave me espresso no, they gave me espresso beans outside. It says session 33, 33. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, we're we're live. We are now live. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is my first time being in charge of the live Zoom button. <laughs> but we're live now. We are. Um, Hello, everyone. I don't know if we have any viewers yet, but um, welcome to Labyrinth's very first uh, live stream about game schooling. And uh, we are here today to talk about using games um, to support education in um, with kids and adults and older people and yeah just games are great for your brain so we're going to talk a little bit about how to use them um i am joined today by rich um who runs all of our normal educational outreach programming uh in case you did not know labyrinth during the normal times runs um tons of educational uh programming we uh, teach after school game clubs at about 13 different schools and have for 10 years. We also run family game nights at local schools and we run strategy board games here in the store and lots of other programming. Um, and Rich kind of oversees most of that. Um, I'm also joined by Melissa, who uh, recently, not recently, how long have you been here now? Like a year, about I think. A year. Yeah, um, joined us about a year ago. And Melissa has a background as a public school teacher. Public and private. Public and private school teacher. And um, it would be interesting if you told them a little bit about what you did when you taught. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I was a teacher, right before moving to the DC area, I've sort of run the gamut. Um, I've taught from fourth grade through high school. I've taught mostly science, but have also taught debate and robotics and things that are sort of science adjacent. Um, in public school, in private school, I have also tutored independently um, all sorts of kids, kids with special needs, kids without special needs, kids that are gifted, kids that might need a little extra help. Um, and I'm also the mom to a five-year-old, so game schooling is kind of my life right now. Um, <laughs> and I think that's about it about me. Yeah. And then Rich joined Labyrinth um, after working at um, another aftercare program yes. and has worked with kids in both a school environment and now with us for several years. Um, and we love having both of them. Yeah. Um, myself, I own Labyrinth Games and Puzzles and um, my background with game schooling is that when I first opened Labyrinth, um, a teacher came in and was floored by the store and uh, she ran a think tank program at element at Maury Elementary and she uh, kind of went crazy about all of the games that were in the store and how they could work with her think tank concept, which was an inquiry based learning environment for the kids um, that also kind of focused on the habits of mind, which are conceptual ideas that lots of successful people have, um, like uh, persistence and in inquisitiveness, things like that. And she used lots of hands-on activities to get the kids involved in this. And uh, Labyrinth's entire educational program kind of came out of that meeting. Uh, when she and I ended up meeting, she ended up writing a grant that I helped her with. And we wrote this big grant to get her a bunch of games in her school. And part of the grant was that I would go in and teach all the teachers how to play the games so that they could use them in the classroom. And we worked together for years and where she was the curriculum side of things and I was the game side of things. And we worked together and we ended up teaching um, professional development classes for DCPS for several years together. And, um, and then I've also kind of overseen all of the programming here. Um, in addition, she has a five-year-old, I have a 16-year-old. And today, nice segue into what we're doing today, we're talking about history games. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about all age groups, but we decided to do history um, 
because it's a really, really great thing that games can support learning because it really um, entices the kids to experience some of the um, some of the activities and learning. History can be very boring to learn out of a book or listening to someone talk about it or um, things like that. And I have found my son hates history, um, hates writing papers, he hates reading things. Um, but yet, if I get him to play a board game, he's completely engaged and just loves it. Um, what do you think? I Melissa was going to tell us a little bit about her thoughts of game schooling. <laughs> ah, yes. So I think game schooling is so incredibly important, especially now when kids are stuck on Zoom for long hours every day. It's nice to be able to like get out and start like touching pieces and moving things around. Um, it doesn't have to be something forceful. Like I remember like doing Science Jeopardy, which is great when you're in the classroom at home, you don't need to like go that hardcore on it. Like it can just be slightly science. Um, again, I'm teaching history to three plus year olds with one of the games that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and some of them are rather than just memorizing facts and dates, it's getting involved in the process and learning about the different eras of time and just piquing your interest like, hmm, you know, what, what exactly was this going on in the world at this time during this game, or maybe this game isn't correct about this thing. Um, so it is so important and it's, you know, sneaking learning in while having fun together as a family, which is so, so important. Um, and we wanted to welcome everyone out there. It does look like we have some viewers now, which is awesome. Yay. Um, we will be recording this and it will be available to watch um, on Twitch for the next few days. And we're also taking all of these videos that we're gonna do and we're gonna put them on our YouTube channel, which has never been used before, but hey, weird <laughs> times call for new things. Um, so we're gonna have all of them eventually on our YouTube channel. Um, yeah, if you are not aware of what Labyrinth is, Labyrinth is a small and uh, friendly local game store in Washington, D.C. We're on Capitol Hill, about six blocks from the U, um, U.S. Capitol, and um, we run generally in normal times, we run about 700 events a year, counting all of our off-site events at schools and our aftercare programs and stuff. Um, we love playing games with kids. We love playing games with grown-ups. And um, that's kind of where we're coming at this whole game schooling. I am very involved in the game schooling um, community on Facebook and in other areas, um, especially because my son has had a very hard time in school, even before we had to do it all virtually. He has dyslexia and dysgraphia that was um, diagnosed very, very, very late. And um, he really struggled with school a lot. And I've homeschooled him a little bit and we've done a lot of different things. And I, when I was homeschooling him, I used games almost entirely. Um, because like you said, we would do a historical game and not really, I didn't want to hit him over the head with all the history, but we'd be playing something like, you know, um, a World War II game, Memoir 44 or something. And it would have all this information in the rule book that I would read beforehand and I wouldn't make him read it. But then <laughs> as we're playing, I just throw in some facts like, oh, you know what? I, I've heard that, you know, on Paris Beach or whatever, this and this and this happened. And then he would get really into it. And then maybe we would watch a documentary about it. And um, it was a really great way for him to get interested in it, but him to also experience it. And even more importantly, and I think this is the kind of idea of what you want history to do is it would bring up conversations for us. So, I mean, the goal, I think, for anyone studying history is to, um, you know, be able to take these things historical and bring them to your modern day life or to learn something from them about what's going on in your life now. And when we would play games with it and be involved in it, we could say, oh, how is that like what's going on with this? Or how is that like this? And it really opened up the conversations a lot. Um, if anyone out there has any questions, both Melissa and I are trying to look at the chat and we would be happy to answer questions as much as possible. So just let us know. Um, do you wanna do your poll first? Yeah, I definitely wanna do my poll. So okay, so we started doing polls with our um, live streams of games 
on Thursday nights, and we've all decided that they're really they're fun. Super fun. <laughs> and we usually start with a silly poll. Um, so our silly poll for today isn't that silly, but it is which period of history do you prefer to study, ancient history or modern history? All right, so, so ancient history is more like ancient Greece, uh, Roman Empire, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. Uh, Confucius, Mesopotamia. Uh, Mesopotamia, and then modern is uh, kind of what World War Two and uh, World. I would say everything World War One and forward. One War One and forward. I don't know okay. what the official definition is. Again, I'm a science teacher, folks. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of different ways to de define the modern era. Right. One of the things that I like the most of um, game schooling is that I learn a ton of stuff. <laughs> okay, so to do polls, what do you do? Uh, so to do polls, in order to vote, if you would like to vote for ancient, you're going to say exclamation vote ancient. Um, or if you would like to vote for modern, you can do exclamation vote modern. Okay, cool. Well, we were what our plan was was to um, answer any questions about game schooling that you might have, and then we wanted to show you a few games and talk to you a little bit about how we've used them in our own either classes or with our family. Um, Melissa's first game is for a uh, preschool or early childhood. Pre um, plus, I can I yeah. can definitely see it, younger kids potentially playing it as well. Yep. Um, so this is a game that we are all probably familiar with, uh, Memory Match. This one happens to be the little feminist uh, memory match game. Where is that camera? There it is. Um, it's, it's very sideways. It's sideways. I, I don't know how to fix that because I don't have that type of visual skills. Um, but this is a game that you can play with our young friends. You can play it with our older friends as well. Um, and it's the game where you flip over the pieces and then take turns trying to find a match. Um, these. Oops. Oops. That was the ceiling. As you can see in this particular game of memory, they are all famous uh, feminist icons throughout history. And there's like really good representation of people from like the ancient past. So we have Cleopatra, uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth the first, who's not quite ancient, but she's up there all the way up to sort of more modern people like Malala and Maya Angelou and uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, so everyone is covered. So you can, this game is great because for the younger kids, you are using a lot of visual recognition and discrimination. So being able to tell just the two pieces apart and then remember where they are is a wonderful skill to begin working with your little kids with. Um, and with these pictures, they're kind of learning some history too. Um, sure, at three years old, they're probably not going to understand the significance of Marie Curie, but just having uh, her in front of them is a good start. Um, and of course, again, you can see that we have a pretty good representation of different uh, races and backgrounds and cultures throughout here. So a kid can probably find a good representation of herself. Um, I've also used this game as not just a memory match game, uh, but you can bring this to restaurants. It's small enough to fit in a handbag. And you can say things like, all right, find me someone who's wearing glasses or find me two ladies that look uh, that have something alike. So they might find two with brown hair or they might find two that have like uh, something like a hat on their head. Um, you can also do things like putting these little pieces around the room and then have them give them clues to go find them. So this is really a multi-function game uh, as long as you get a little bit creative. And though if they don't know who Frida Kahlo is by the end of it, that's okay. They've seen it and it is still sort of making their way into their little sponge-like brain. Uh, so again, this is age for ages three plus, maybe a little bit younger, depending on the sort of dexterity level of the kiddo, uh, and two players, but it's a little bit flexible, so you can definitely play as team members, um, and it plays in about you know, five minutes or so. So that's Little Miss Memory Match. <laughs> yeah, I love this game. I think memory games are phenomenal as first games. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that if you have a very young child, you do not have to use all of these yeah. matching things. You could just take a uh, four, four and then mix them up and have like if your child is like one or well two maybe one is a little bit young, but um, and then tell them like okay find one that matches and they flip over two and they're like oh those don't match okay we'll find another one that matches and then they go like this and then they're like oh yeah it was here mm -hmm. and then a lot of times i'll have oh yeah that's malala um and what did she do and i'll tell her something about mm -hmm. um malala 
And um, sometimes you have to study a little bit yourself. That's okay. But, um, you know, I'll be like, oh, she loves school so much and this and that. And um, do you like school? And then you can start talking to the child. It's a great way. As I said, games are a really good way to get your kids engaged in conversation because it's not like you're questioning them. No, nope. you're just like... Um, and you're doing something fun. And yeah. you can even start face up, like just mix them all up and say, okay, find the ones that match. Yep. For really young kids, you can start yeah. with them face up. Um, a lot of times too, what I'll do, and I think that one of the big misconceptions among people who do not play a lot of games is that kids can't learn to play more complicated games and they can't learn complicated information. I do not think that, I mean, we run game classes at 13 plus schools. Um, even our really, our youngest kids are three years old within a month or two, we've got them playing some pretty complex games and they can definitely learn, you know, um, learn rules. Yeah. Uh, Cleopatra was the queen of, uh, Egypt. They can mm -hmm. learn that easy. They can learn, you know, Rosa Parks, um, who these people are. And this is a great way. And there's, I know there's a ton of books out there that are really easy, like storybooks about some of these people. I think that this actual Limitable Feminist has a book series that goes along yeah, with it. I did not know that. Yeah, so I think that that's really cool. So what do you think? I think it's awesome. Uh, I do think that it, it sounds trite to say, but the best part about uh, games in for schooling is that they are games. So <laughs> they're just fun to play. So you really are, introducing stuff that's uh, that's educational or at least stuff that gets uh, opens the door for interest without being uh, pushy, mm -hmm. um, which a lot of times I think is sometimes is more engaging uh, in a lot of ways when, when you're not feeling like you're being lectured at, but you're just saying, oh, well, who is that person? Well, I want to know more. Um, and then it's a great way to, to prompt people to go on their own. Do we want to talk about the next game? I think yes. So. Um, I think we have our, this is kind of sideways, isn't it? Is it weird sideways, like on the camera? Um, I think so. This Can area you... is sideways, right? Is there anybody Whoa. out there? Is it? Whoa. Oh, Whoa. Here we go. Um, there we go. That's right. That's Yay, better. now that's much better. Whoa. Okay. Okay, that was really weird to watch. That was really weird to watch, but now we're at least right, right side up. And then pack up these nice <laughs> ladies. Are we going to do timeline next? I think so. I think it makes sense to go like yes. youngest to oldest so people know what's coming. Yes, sure. for sure. All right. So the next really cool game I would like to talk about, let's see if I can get it up here on the camera, is timeline. This particular version is timeline events. There are several different varieties of this game with all different themes, but they all have the same uh, general idea on them. In timeline, you are doing something that probably many of you have done in school, which is make a timeline. Um, I know that at my daughter's school, the very first timeline she made was a timeline of her life. It was really short because she was four at the time. <laughs> um, and it had things like, I had ice cream last night. So, you know, this is a little bit more sophisticated than that. So in this game, each player is going to get, I believe it is uh, four. four cards, and you're going to have a starting card. So in this case, our starting card is Emergence of the Dinosaurs, which is easier if you can see. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Emergence of the Dinosaurs. Every player is then going to take a turn looking at their hand and figuring out if they can place something on this timeline. So I have sort of stacked the deck in my favor. Um, and I you have, have to know when the emergency of the dinosaurs oh, was. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit over on the yeah. number side. So that was a very, very long time ago. So I have a feeling that maybe Melissa will have an easy first card. I do have a very easy first uh -huh. card. So the emergence of the dinosaurs. The next card that I have is the extinction of the dinosaurs. So oh, I bet that that's her. So what you would do is you have four cards in your hand and when it's your turn to play, you will play this where you think it goes in the timeline. Do you think the extinction was before the emergence or after the emergence? <laughs> I'm betting after. And then you flip it over. Oops, <laughs> you flip it over. And if the time is actually in the right place, you go, yay, and you've gotten rid of one of your cards, um, which is good because the object of the game is to get, get rid, rid of, of all your cards. cards. There's a lot of years between the emergence. There the are. Emergence. There are. It's true. And in yeah. this game, um, the negatives are uh, 
what the ancient era yeah the very ancient BC. yeah bc um i think they call it something now they BC. call it BCE. bce um before a common era so that's what negatives are so this was all a really 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 long time ago yep and that's sort of an easier one and you can see that as once you start like filling out different events here it's going to get a little bit trickier to place exactly where on the timeline your event goes um and it covers a gamut this is the events deck as i already mentioned so it's a lot of things like you know uh the black death starts spreading in europe the first nav circumnavigation of the earth what are some other good ones oh, napoleon becomes of... empire so again and it goes all the way up to sort of like modern times first and to walk on the moon i bet that was after the extinction of the dinosaurs I think Dolly that and the that's mammals. what i'm thinking and i think that the first circumnavigation of the earth was before, before that. the oh that's yeah. good the first publication of harry potter Harry Potter. Harry Potter's right here. Oh, he was definitely after the first man on the moon. I hope so. Yeah. All right. So, so, see. but you can see how the timeline starts filling in, and then all of a sudden you have to figure out, oops, Whoops. and Rich was wrong. Was so that's wrong. a very, very good idea of um what happens if you're wrong. If you have a card and you play it in the wrong location then that card leaves the timeline and, you, draw a new and one. you have to draw a new one so that basically you do not get a, a card that round. Um, one of the very important things too is you must win without tying. Correct. So if you play a tie, if you play something and you're out of cards and then someone in a later turn that round is out of cards too, you have to keep playing Sun and Death um until uh until somebody is completely without a card even when the other person has a chance to go which i think is something that a lot of people miss in the rules sometimes. i agree and yep. beyond just like sort of getting kids into this timeline and sort of general scope of what's happening in history it's interesting because as you i mean in theory you could mix these all up and have the kids spend an afternoon sorting them into one really big long timeline but they'd be able to start seeing maybe some patterns um and i mean simple things like the extinction of the dinosaurs comes after the emergence of the dinosaurs and the patterns in wars and discovering new lands, things like that. Um, I've also done things in my own classroom where they've made a science version of this game. So they were taking famous scientific discoveries and they drew them out on index cards, you know, just like these. Uh, it's a little bit bigger, but you know, with the picture on one side and the date on the other. Um, so you can add pretty much any events that you want. You can even do sort of a family version. Um, again, my daughter's only four, so hers would be real short. But you know, if you have a teenager, it would be interesting to see what they would come up with for their own personal timeline. Um, all of the decks, there's again several themes. Uh, the ones that I know about that we carry are classic events and the inventions. I think it's inventions. I like inventions a lot. I like inventions a lot too. Um, they can all be mixed together, which yes. makes it quite difficult actually. So. I was surprised to learn how old toothbrushes are. Yes. yes. Yeah. And that toothbrushes were after the invention of bourbon, I think. I don't yeah. know. That, that is pretty important, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting because in each of the different groups, if you see here how um, they have a colored background where the date is, uh, this is the event, so it's blue. All of the other um, games have different colors. So if you mix them together, you can sort them back out. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, like you were saying, building your own time game and a family game, I really like just doing my own cards. But the other thing that I really enjoy doing is when my son is studying a per specific time. Um, for example, he was doing the Industrial Revolution last year. I went through all of our sets and got out everything from around that time. And we just played with that shorter time, which made it a lot harder. Um, with younger children, you can make it easier by doing things like the dinosaurs, the man on the moon and something else. And you can take cards out of this deck and stack the deck a little bit so that you know you're playing with things that the child should be learning and you're not making. I mean, I know in some of them, it's like the assassination of Lincoln and the yeah. end of the Civil War and all of that are like all within, you know, a few years mm -hmm. of one another. And it can get really, really tough to put them in the right order. Um, but yeah, sometimes if you go through and choose 
you can choose to make it a little bit easier. Yeah, or you can put them on teams. And um, this is a game I've definitely played with my husband and I, my daughter who is five, and both of her grandmothers. So, I mean, she was obviously on a team with us, but she, yeah, you know, she was able to make some inferences just based on the pictures alone about where things went. And it was like fairly successful. Yeah, it's really interesting to talk about what the pictures are. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the pictures help, sometimes they don't. Nope. <laughs> um, our seniors group, this is one of their favorite games too. And I found with people with dementia, this is a great game because all of them started talking about, one of them was the first hot air balloon or something and like the thing in Paris where the hot air balloons were shown and whatever. And they all started talking about like historical things about hot air balloons and stuff. But it's a, again, another great way to bring up conversations. Yeah. And I think we're about ready to conclude our poll as okay, well. Okay, our poll is over. Which is very exciting. All right, so in today's silly poll, the winner by a vote <laughs> is the ancient history. All right, ancient history wins, nice. I like ancient history. I like ancient history. You know, I have a problem with history. I, um, I double majored in Spanish and Latin American history. And I always liked history of um, like third world countries. I was always really into third world country history because it was shorter than Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I had to do world history or European history, or anything, it was just way too long. And then, you know, you had like the Incans and the Aztecs and the Mayans and stuff, but they were all kind of there. And then it wasn't as long or complicated. <laughs> Kathleen likes to study civilizations that are no longer here. Right, no, definitely. No. Yeah, it's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, okay, our next game is Similo. Yes. Yes. Okay, you want to grab the box and show everybody Similo? All right. This is a new, oops, now it's upside down again. Um, this is a newer game for Labyrinth. We actually, it came out, I don't know, a few months ago, probably several months ago. And I didn't bring it in, and then I played it, and I absolutely loved it. And I think it's fantastic for game schooling. I love, love, love it. Um, and we just recently got it in, and so now it's here. And there are, right now, there's two variations. There's this one, which is a history variation, and then there's also a myth one that's all about all different kinds of myths. Um, and so we're going to play. Huzzah. Huzzah. Okay, so we're going to show you how this works by playing. Um, who wants to be the person in charge? This is a cooperative game. Do you want to be the person in charge of giving the clues or do you want me to? Either or. I'll cheat <laughs> you for it. Yeah, let's okay. do okay. this One, two, three. Ah. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh, right. Ah, he got me. Okay, <laughs> so you are, um, so that is the 12, and then you get five cards? Uh, yes. Okay. So the first thing that you do is you take one of, um, one of the cards and you look at it, and that is going to be your secret person. Um, this has a whole bunch of historical characters in it. And so only Rich will know who that secret person is. And then you take that and you mix it all up with all the other. And we're gonna lay out a grid of 12 people, kind of if you've ever played code names or something like that. Um, so we have Abraham Lincoln. This game is played in four rounds, four or five rounds. Um, so we have Hypatia. Philosopher and astronomer. And there's a little. There's a little blurb of text on the side of each uh, each card. So it'll have a picture of the figure and their name in the top corner. And then on the bottom, it'll say Marie Curie, for example, Polish chemist, researcher on radioactivity, and the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. And it gives you the dates of their life. Or if we don't know how long they lived exactly, it gives you an approximation. Um, We've got Vincent van Gogh, Saladin, Sitting Bull, Confucius, Boudicca, and Bonnie. And I'm going to scoot these up because it looks like they're getting a little glary. Getting a little squishy. Yeah. We also have Catherine the Great, Montezuma. 
I studied a lot about him. And then we've got Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley, excellent. And then this is your card of hand. Okay. Okay, so y'all can help us here if you want to. Um, what we're going to do is Rich has a handful of five cards. We are going to try, do you want to move this over? I don't know if you can reach. We're going to try and figure out who his secret person is. And he's going to give us clues by playing a card either um, vertically or horizontally. If he plays it vertically, he is trying to tell us without talking um, that yesterday Rich did not do very well at not talking. I got very excited. Um, <laughs> he is going to tell us whether that person is similar to the person we're trying to find or not similar to the person we're trying to find. Um, and then we have to, the first time we, the first round, we have to choose one person to remove from the game and hopefully it's not the secret person. Uh, the second time we have to remove two people. The third time we have to remove three, three people mm -hmm. and so on um, so until we have, we have two people left and we have to choose which is which. And we wanna see how far we can get before we remove the person who is the secret 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 person okay sure. so go for it okay so the first person i'm putting down i'm putting down sideways which means they are unlike the secret person that so they are not like alexander the great right they are not like alexander the great melissa what okay. do you think um let's see alexander the great is the king of macedonia who conquered and uh the entire persian empire so not a conqueror potentially not, a king. not not a well. I don't think Alexander the Great was. Was he a king? He's. Um, he was. He's oh, he was king talk. of Macedonia. <laughs> You're not allowed to talk. You're right. King of Macedonia. Yeah, so not a king. king. Um, maybe not royalty. Not great. Not great. <laughs> so you want to flip over Alex, uh, Catherine the Great? <laughs> I kind of want to flip over Montezuma. You want to do Montezuma or uh, Catherine the Great? Either is fine. You can pick. Okay, let's do Montezuma. Okay, we are flipping over Montezuma. Bye, Montezuma. Are we right? You're still in. Okay, we're still in. Okay, good. Okay. Whew. Okay, round one done. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put out another unlike. Oh, no. Unlike another so unlike. Okay, so not, and did you draw a card? Between I your turn, you're supposed yes. to draw another card. So I went down to four cards, and then I drew one up, which gave me another option, uh, which I'm going to play as an this person is not like Cleopatra. Okay, not like Cleopatra. Another ruler, another Cleopatra was mm -hmm. um, Egyptian queen, uh, the last ruler of the Ptolemaic uh, kingdom, 69 BC to 30 BC. So um, now we have to choose two people. Oh my goodness. Okay, so rulers, maybe not, not, um, not a Catherine queen. the Great. Yeah, we could try to flip over Catherine okay, the Great. Okay, we're going to flip over Catherine the Great um and and then who else do we want to flip over this lady ruler mm, Boudica is stop batting that counts as stopping I'm sorry oh <laughs> queen of the British Celtic Iceni tribe who fought against the Romans so you want to flip her over I want to flip her over I also kind okay. of want to be her so She's, yeah she looks super cool what she does I? look she looks really cool I, to, I think I, See, this is history that I'm learning. I am definitely going to go read a book yep. about her for sure. And like, look how pretty these cards are. They're yeah, like super, I love the art. The art is amazing. Yeah, the art is great. I'm not okay. allowed to talk, but she's one of my favorite historical figures. That, yeah. that type of talk is allowed. <laughs> I really like the background of Vincent Van Gogh, too. I think his background's really cool. Does he have both ears in this particular? Well, no, you can't see one of them. Ah. Ah. Okay, and this is like William Shakespeare. Okay. Okay. I've... So, like William Shakespeare, now we have to do three cards. So we've got Nod, a ruler, possibly, mm -hmm. and he is a writer. So Mary Shelley was a writer. Shelley, Shelley, I want to keep Confucius. Yeah, Confucius definitely. Hypatia. They're all writers. Hypatia, they yeah. wrote, yeah. I... Annie Bonny, I don't think, yeah, wrote. I... So no, she's a pirate. Her? Okay, so that's one. What about, who's this? Saladin. Saladin. I don't know. I don't He's know. the first sultan of Egypt and Syria, leader of the Muslim armies during the Crusades. Mm, I think he would be safe to flip, maybe. I agree. I mean, yeah. And then what about um, 
Abraham Lincoln wrote some stuff. Yeah. But he was also a ruler. Um, maybe Sitting Bull? Yeah, sure. Okay, let's flip Sitting Bull. Okay, are we still in it? Still in it. Yay! Yay! Okay. I'm getting stressed now. I know. <laughs> now this next time we have to do four people and then we'll be left with the last two if we can do it. I don't know. We'll have to see. Okay. Mm. Okay, what are we doing? Uh-oh. Why is he making noise? Not like... Oh, the I don't guy. know how to say his name. This is the guy who painted the wave picture. Katsushiki Hokusai. Katsushiki Hokusai. Okay, Hokusai. now we've got to somehow do four cards. And we've got like William Shakespeare, but not like Katsushiki. Shika. Shiku. Shiku? Shiku or Ka? Ka. Um, Hokusai. 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 Um, okay. Vincent Van Gogh. Yeah, because he was a painter and he's a painter. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Wait. Yes, because I was so flip. Thing. Yeah, flip. I, I can't Vincent. do that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> you flipped Vincent. Are Vincent. we all right with that one? Yes. yes. Bye, Vincent. Okay. Stop talking. Um, I don't think that Abraham Lincoln fits. No. Okay. Not based on the other ones. Um, and I don't think Marie Curie fits either. Yeah, she's more of a scientist. Yeah, but let's she's super her cool. over. Okay, and then Spider. Twitch chat, help. Yeah, what do you <laughs> think? Hypatia, Confucius, or Mary Shelley? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Science teacher. Um, I think. I think that maybe not like. We get one more clue. I forget. I or is this maybe Hypatia? One? No, we get one more because we have to choose between. But maybe Hypatia? Okay. Okay. Flip Hypatia. Are we still in it? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now we've got to figure out whatever clue you give us has to tell us. It has to be a good clue. Like between Mary Shelley and Confucius. Because right now I'm not really feeling which one. Mm -hmm. You drew a card, right? I did draw a card. Okay. Not like Tutankhamen. Common. Twitch chat. <laughs> oh, Legends DM is here. Hi, Legends DM. Hey, Legends DM. How are you? Wait, you were Team Kathleen last time. <laughs> and we're playing a cooperative game. So but that's okay. You can be a team staff tomorrow when we're playing a different game. No, we're playing Abomination tomorrow night. Not for children. Definitely not for children. Please don't have them tune in. Yes. Um, okay, so not to common. It's our it's our last turn. What are we gonna do? I mean, he has a hat. Yeah, he's wearing and a he hat. has a hat. I like the hat. <laughs> Look over Mary Shelley. Um no, one of them this is eyelids? not like this is not like. Oh, so flip over a Confucius. Yeah, I think so. They both have hats. They both have hats. We're going with that. We're going for it. Very historical accurately. We got it. Did we do yeah. it? Yay! We two uh, English writers. Yep. And then the rest, I was just trying to say um, not rulers, which you guys got. And I tried to be like, not from longer ago, but from closer. And then you <laughs> saw the hat. And I was like, oh, I'm safe. <laughs> There's a hat. Yeah. But anyway, that's Simolo. Um, we've been having a really good time playing this a lot. Um, I have learned things about historical figures that I did not know. And um, I thought it was great. Um, so that is Simolo. That's mean, our shirts are not up on the e-com store yet, are they? No. OK, I'm just going to tell them to uh, please order <laughs> orders at labrasgameshop.com. At labrasgameshop.com. I don't think our t-shirts are there either. Well, if no, you, but he can just email us. Yeah, if you email us. Um, also, I can try and have somebody put shirts up tomorrow because I've been meaning to do it for a really long time anyway. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so does anybody have any questions yet? Did we have any questions uh, besides Legends DM? Hello. Okay. Um, do you want to do... Now we're getting into the older kids. Um, both of these are games that we used in middle school and high school. Um, Rich, you want to talk a little bit about your? Oh my gosh! Yes, I do. Stuff. This is one of Rich's favorite games. Not so. one of. This is my favorite game ever. Um, and when I say that to people, they 
usually have one of two reactions. It's, oh my gosh, that game is so great. Or they look at me like I'm a psychopath. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is this is a really uh, storied game. It's got a bit of a reputation for being tricky to play because, um, and I think a, a not well-deserved reputation uh, because it is, uh, there's no chance in it. It's all about negotiating. It's a game called Diplomacy that aims to uh, roughly make an ahistorical version of uh, 1900 onwards, the lead up to World War I. So uh, players in this game are playing as uh, one of seven great powers around the board. Um, Turkey, Russia, Germany, all familiar things. And then you see Austria-Hungary. And if you're in middle school, like I was at the time when I first played that, I go, what's Austria-Hungary? And then that turned into a whole dizzying lesson. Um, I should say full disclosure, the first time I played this game was actually at school in a club started by a very great history teacher of mine. Um, and it was a very sneaky way to uh, get us to all learn some European geography and also uh, learn a little bit about the period. Um, so this game itself has been around since the 50s. Um, it was played in the Kennedy White House famously. Um, it's actually the first commercial game that was ever played by mail, which I think makes it especially relevant to today because you can play this over email. You don't have to uh, be in the same space. As long as somebody has a board and is able to keep track. Um, and the new board is actually much prettier than my old board. This is my old board here. And we've got this great new board, um, which is the 50th, over on the back. They can see a picture of it. the 50th anniversary version. Um, and actually, this is upside down. Uh, it's an upside down there. Sure. The, uh, so this is the 50th anniversary, which I think was over 10 years ago. This, Game is well older than anybody in this room, um, <laughs> but yeah, this was this game used to be played by mail. Um, yeah. yeah, when it first came out, they made fanzines for it. They made magazines to to distribute to play this game. Um, so how does it work? Well, uh, there are no dice. What you're trying to do is take over. There's a bunch of little dots all over the board, and you're trying to snag them all up because there's 34 of them all together. Right, uh, and you want to control 18 of them, which is kind of tricky at the start of the game because, uh, it's well, that I have 18 pieces. Yeah, there's <laughs> nobody has 18 pieces. You start off with only three, or if you're uh, Russia, you start off with four, um, mm -hmm. and then everybody looks at you and says, "Why do you start off with four pieces?" And then you go, "Well, I feel like I've got a lot more space to try to defend, and I'm really afraid." Um, which. <laughs> uh, what we're doing is you're going to write down in secret your orders, and they all happen at the same time. So instead of rolling dice to uh, resolve a conflict in this game, we're going to see who has more stuff um, that's attacking or taking over a certain spot. Um, and the way we do that, right, so I would have my secret message here. You're showing it upside down. I'm showing it upside down. I'd have my secret orders. So if I was playing as Germany, I've written out here that my army in Berlin is going to move to Kiel, and my fleet in Kiel is going to move to Denmark, and my army in Munich is going to move to Ruhr. And all that is going to happen at the same time as everybody else's orders. So I hope I did a good job talking to everybody else before the turn timer expired, and then all the moves happen. And hopefully, nobody tries to move where I went. Um, or nobody gets angry at me for moving to certain places. That's the whole point of the game, isn't it? Yeah, the whole point of the game <laughs> is, people angry. is to avoid getting people angry at the wrong time. Um, so yeah, just the simple math of the game, there's only 12 spaces that are neutral, and uh, you're going to have to get a space from somebody that they don't want to give you. Um, the reason I think- What happens if somebody does move into your space? So if they move into your space and take Put it over- table. Um, you're going to first get very, very angry at them and ah. say, I thought we had a deal. Uh, but what will happen is after a couple turns, we'll find out, oh, look, England's here and they've taken a dot from Germany. So now England has four dots instead of the three they started with. And Germany only has two dots instead of the three they started with. So because England got more dots than they started with, they get to build stuff so that they make those numbers equal. 
They have three units. Now they get four because they have four dots. Uh, Germany only has two dots left, so they are going to lose a unit. Um, and it's really that simple. The person who made it played a lot of hearts. And what they realized when they were playing hearts is that it's really smart when you're playing a game of hearts to gang up on the person who's winning. Uh, so they wanted to make a game that played sort of like chess, like there's limited space and there's no dice, no chance. Um, but how do you do that in a way that uh, makes it interesting where we're gonna wanna gang up on the person who's getting ahead? Um, and a side effect of this is that when you're playing, you're really doing your best to convince your other people around you that you're not getting ahead and that you are you need their help and that they need your help. Um, and when you're in seventh grade, uh, <laughs> that's a really, really uh, enticing and evocative thing to try to be doing. Um, you get to feel really clever and sometimes you get to be very surprised at how easily you were tricked, um, which I think are valuable experiences uh, growing up. Tough life lesson right there. <laughs> it's, it's true. And, um, <laughs> then you're gonna also, as you play, start noticing certain things about the map, like, oh gee, there's a whole bunch of stuff down here in the Balkans. Why are there so many dots there? Why is everybody scrambling to try and get all that stuff? And that can turn into a segue about, you know, if we wanna talk about the Balkans in the lead up to World War I, um, that's why this map thinks they're so important. Um, there's just like lots of little tiny, wonderful evocative opportunities to learn about um, this frame of history. Um, so I, I heartily recommend it, um, and if you look it up uh, on Google, you will see that there are still tons of sites and things dedicated to playing this game, um, and that it's a game that you can play remotely. And when you write out your orders, if there's seven of you playing the game, um, we used to do it that we would have somebody, because there were so many of us who wanted to play in only seven spots, that uh, some of the kids would be press and they'd go around and talk to all the other kids and write out their press releases. Uh, <laughs> and these are, by the way- Wow, you were really a nerd. <laughs> I, was, I was a huge, uh, full, full disclosure, yeah. Um, but it was, it was great fun. And uh, it also got us to write without realizing that we were doing a lot of writing um, to each other. So before we go to our next game, if someone wants to play this game remotely, like today, because we don't see people anymore, how, what would, what tips would you give them? Sure, I would say um, you can set up an email chain. Um, there's also a site called Web Diplomacy that is dedicated to having um, remote games. Mm. Um, but if you're doing it with a group of kids, the way that my history teacher was doing, and they already have like, you know, a, maybe a classroom relationship with each other, um, then the game comes with little tiny uh, maps of this exact board so everybody can see how things are. Um, and then because everything happens all at once and then we find out where everything ended up, uh, we'll set a timer. We'll say, all right, today we're gonna do one turn and then on Wednesday we'll do the next turn. And then there's going to be a bunch of frantic emails and messages being written between players between those two times. And if that time rolls around and you don't have your orders in, or if you write something that doesn't work, I'm sorry, your stuff is in civil disorder and doesn't get to do anything this turn. Um, it's a tremendous, tremendously fun time um, and a little bit stressful, but in the best possible way. Yeah, I would way. think if, if there's one house somewhere that wanted to hold the board, you can... You can certainly buy this from Labyrinth on our web store yeah. and um, kind of have a board set up. And then we, um, a while ago, we had a staff customer game that they played either by coming in the store and submitting their orders or they would email us the orders. Um, we had to not allow that anymore because customers and staff were not speaking about halfway through the game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it can be contentious, but I think going back to what Rich said, um, learning to negotiate and as long as nobody takes it super personally, understanding that things are going to go wrong in this game and that you're not necessarily always going to get your way. I think learn, le lose, like living with that kind of defeat and, and success and having to discuss with other people and negotiate and stuff are important life lessons that games frequently um, can give. And of all games, the wonderful thing I think with game schooling is that you're teaching them 
subject matter and you're learning things, be it math or language or spelling or whatever, but you're also learning all of those kind of soft skills. You're learning um, strategic thought. You're learning reading body language and lots of other things. Yeah, it's good for developing interpersonal <laughs> communication skills uh, to get really jargony <laughs> about it. Um, and it's it's really, I can't stress how much fun and silly things have happened from playing this game. I remember a friend of mine very angrily yelling at me for putting my fleet in the English channel because I quote, was not England. <laughs> that is called the English channel. You should have, <laughs> only England can go there. And I remember also waiting up and trying to remember, wait a minute, is, uh, is, a, is Prussia adjacent to Warsaw? <laughs> and without realizing it, I was, kind of memorizing a very loose idea of Eastern European geography. Um, it's true. Cool. But yeah, I cool, love this cool. game. I hope that more people play it because it's just wonderful. <laughs> um, I think important things to tell people is it can be a very long game. You will probably want to play it over days. Um, if you're playing it at one seating, it can take Four hours. Uh, yeah, four or five hours, six hours. It can definitely be a very long game because you have to leave the time for the negotiations and then um, dealing with that. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's fantastic. <clears throat> okay, are we going to now move going on to, to my game? game? And if you just want to like slide it over. I can and slide it camera. over. Um, Here it comes. Oh my goodness. You can't even see all of it on the thing. Um, <laughs> slide it back and forth. No, that's okay. I am talking about, this is one of my absolute favorite game schooling games. Um, this is called Founding Fathers. Let's see where my mouse is. Founding Fathers. Um, Founding Fathers is a game that was created by local game designers, Christian Leonard and Jason Matthews. If you are um, regular Labyrinth uh, uh, customers, or if you attend our events, you will know Jason Matthews because he's frequently um, here at the store. He's a wonderful local um, game designer and he is a friend of mine. Um, he also works in various different um, governmental type things. And he has as his, uh, as his kind of side job hobby, um, designing award-winning games. Um, he is the <laughs> game designer of Twilight Struggle and um, of the new Imperial Struggle, and he did this game. He also did 1960 Making of a President. Um, Founding Fathers has been out of print for quite a long time, and I'm hoping that they will reprint it, but I happened to find a whole bunch of copies the other day and we have them in the store now and we have them for sale. Um, I do not know how long they will last, but we do have quite a few. I bought every copy I could find. Um, the people who now own the, well, who owned the license of it were cleaning up their um, warehouse during the quarantine and found a few boxes and knew how much I loved this game and called me and I said, yes, I want all of it. So <laughs> we now, I think, own all of the founding college that's left. Um, this game, the reason that I love it is because the concept of the game is to create the um, constitution. Um, it is, you're basically playing as the founding fathers um, you can play as James Madison um, or William Patterson um, or Roger Sherman if you're playing a three-player game. This do game does need at least three players um, and it can play up to five players. Um, if you add four players, you can also be Charles Pickney. Um, he is, if you have four players, he gets into the mix. And if you have five players, everybody um, always asks about Alexander Hamilton. So as if you are playing with five players, you add Alexander Hamilton as one of the potential people that you can play. So that's what you wanted to be, right? I want to be Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing is you will have um, a card for your founding father. 
Um, here is an example of a card. This is the James Madison card. Whoever, you basically randomize all of these boards and you hand them out and that's how you figure out who's playing what. Um, James Madison goes first because he um, wrote and brought the Virginia plan to the Constitutional Convention, which was held in Philadelphia. Um, one of the things that I think is phenomenal about this game is that the board is actually laid out kind of like half of the hall um, or the building where they held the Constitution. Independence so, Hall yeah, in Philadelphia. Independence hall. Yeah. Yes, Independence okay. Hall in Philadelphia. Um, this is the assembly room here. Um, and in this game, this is this is the score tracker, and it's kind of a reimagined circular stairwell going up to the Liberty Bell, which wasn't called the Liberty Bell at that time. Um, but the Liberty Bell was indeed on the second floor of this of Independence Hall. And this center hall here, we have a debate floor. Um, and it's represented by this debate track. And then we also have a committee room. And the thing that's amazing is in the rule book, it talks all about the history that led up to the Constitutional Convention, um, why you know the Virginia plan came in and James Madison uh, presented it and all of the arguments over the months and things and how the um, founding fathers debated and all of this different stuff. For example, the committee room was actually on the second floor, but for purposes of having it all on one board, they've kind of moved things around. The assembly room, oh, this is really cool. Did you see that the um, desk where Washington sat actually has his inkwell and it has the rising sun chair on it? So there's all kinds of stuff with this board that you can get into. Oh, there's like trivia on the card. There is, there's a ton of stuff. So um, there's the I think that this is one of the interesting things I find about a lot of historical board games is you have the actual playing of this game on your turn, you can either take cards of all one state and place them into the assembly vote room voting yay or nay, or you can use them for other things. You can use them for an event that is on them. Like this one is the in constant Mrs. Rand Randolph and it tells you what happens. Um, but you can also, but there's also the flavor text. And I think, especially when you're dealing with a kid, having them read the flavor text as much as you can, sometimes they'll get bored and won't wanna do it. But a lot of times I'll be like, oh wait, who is this person? And then I'll read, you know, as the youngest delegate at the convention, Dayton's relative inexperience occasionally showed itself in debate. And so then you start learning about things and that has no true um, you know, effect on the game, but it is really interesting. The thing that I find incredibly interesting is Jason and Christian actually made what the people did at the Constitutional Convention um, relate into a lot of the events that are on the card. So like this event is the Cal OU. Um, and so it's actually because he was young and things, then it affects what the event on his card is. I remember the first time I ever played this, I had, I don't know if, oh yeah, I had George Washington and I was playing with a bunch of um, our customers and it was not too long after we opened Labyrinth and George Washington has as his ability that you can just instantly end the current round and you resolve all of the articles currently under consideration in the assembly room. Um, so you're basically ending the round early. And um, if there are more yays, then it passes. And if there are more nays, it fails. Um, this was fantastic. I ended up winning the game by calling it early. And everybody got furious at me because they had planned out like the end of the game and I just ended it early with Washington, uh, with George Washington. And I told Jason, Jason was here teaching us how to play. And I'm like, God, I feel so bad. I just really was a complete jerk to all of our customers. And he's like, well, you know, the con Constitutional Convention was very contentious and they really made each other mad a lot. But um, so it was really funny. It was very um, thematic, I think. It made me really feel 
what was happening at the Constitutional Convention. And how long does it take to play this game? It usually takes between an hour and two. I would say definitely if you want to experience the historical aspects, it'll probably be more like two hours. Um, basically what you do is you have a hand of three cards. You're going to, on your turn, play them either into the assembly room, voting yay or nay, um, or to move up on these debate tracks, which that's big states, small states, anti-federalist and federalist. So there's four different factions represented in the game. Each of the constitutional articles is represented both the historical aspect of it, like what actually got passed into the convention, which this one is the ratification of um, this, the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient to pass the constitution. But on the other side, there is something that was actually proposed. So this one was um, that all 13 uh, states or all 13 colonies had to ratify the constitution. And the one that actually got into the constitution is this one. But based on whether these pass or don't pass, they basically get put out and you'll see that they're federalist or anti-federalist. And depending on how many tokens you have from the debate room is how you get points, basically. So you'll get points if there's like a ton of anti-federalist stuff and you have anti-federalist tokens. And that's kind of how you're scoring it. The cool thing about once a vote happens, either there needs to be seven yays or six nays to call the end of the round. And then whoever loses in the assembly room goes to the committee room. And it's basically um, like doing backroom deals and maybe <laughs> you'll get one of your articles in the constitution. So whoever loses the most still has a chance to affect the game, which I think That's is really insane. cool too. Yeah. Um, and that is Founding Fathers. I think Founding Fathers is an amazing game to talk about the constitution, to talk about um, all the different founding fathers. It gives you tons of information about all of them. Cool. Yeah, I love this game. <laughs> I really want to play it. Yeah, it's fantastic. That was neat. Yeah. Yep, yep. Maybe we'll, on a future one, maybe we can all play this That's and everybody can watch. Yep. Only um, if we can fight loudly. Okay. I want to argue and debate loudly. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we can do that. Excellent. Um, <laughs> So those are some of our favorite history games. Um, there are so many more. Um, and I wanted to mention one thing that I thought was kind of cool. Uh, Melissa and I and Rich have worked on on our web store that we built since the um, quarantine happened. We have built a game schooling filter. So, and I haven't seen it on very many other commercial websites, um, but if you go to our web store, which is store.labyrinthgameshop.com, and you can choose to look at games or puzzles by age group, and then on the left-hand side, it actually has a game schooling filter. And if you're looking for history games or that are appropriate for a five-year-old or history games that are appropriate for 12 plus year old, you can click on that and um, it will show you a pretty large selection of what we have. And Melissa and I and Rich have been going and really trying to tag things. And we're also trying, oops, nope. I was trying to share our website, it didn't work. Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of different people, but um, yeah. So we're trying to add even more uh, areas of learning to it all the time. So um, keep an eye on it and it's going to be more and more robust as we uh, can do that. Um, but yeah, what else? Do y'all have anything to say in closing? I hope y'all had fun and I hope you learned something and I hope that uh, you'll join us next week. What are we gonna do next week? Um, I have it written down, but not on the sheet of paper. I want to say that it is potentially English. English? Maybe science, I forget. Yeah, English or science, we'll post on Facebook and we'll post on the mm -hmm. website and different things. But yeah, we'll be back talking about another subject. And then I think in the future, we might actually play some games like Founding Fathers or some other yep. more complicated games to really teach y'all 
the rules in detail and help people learn yeah, how to do some of these. We'll thank go. you, person whose name I can't read because my eyes Meg are Meg2104. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. I hope y'all had fun and have fun playing with your kids and your family and your friends as much as you can um, while staying safe and healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Everyone wave. <laughs> everyone wave.